thank you everybody for being here. It's been a great year getting to know some some new people this way, which has been which has been really nice. And we will continue these in in January until we're we're opened up. We will we will continue doing these. We don't have topics yet. That's mostly because I haven't thought that far ahead yet. But we'll we'll uh, we'll be getting them them out there at some point. And we've got a, a pretty good number of people here. Some of you are, have been showing up for 36 weeks and apparently will listen to anything. But uh, for those of you who are here specifically for the, the Rock Garden Talks, I would encourage you, we co-host the local regional Rock Garden Society at the Arboretum and have lectures. Chris mentioned the next one that's coming up with Dick Tyler, who's talking about hellebores. But I'd also encourage you to go to our YouTube page. We have a lot of the past speakers from our the Rock Garden Society events at the Arboretum that are on there. And I'd also say, you know, you should consider joining the, the Rock Garden Society. It's a great group. They have fantastic speakers who come through, both local and ones from further afield. So definitely would, would encourage that. You know, this was really just me thinking about you know, what are some of the rock gardens that I really, really love during my travels? Uh, this is certainly not all of them that are around by a long shot. This is certainly not, not even scratching the surface of what's out there. And I realized after I did it that I didn't put anything about our rock gardens, our crevice gardens, our scree gardens, or our Sister institution, Juniper Level Botanic Garden, Plant Delights Nursery, they're amazing gardens. I was thinking further afield, I think I've been missing the travel aspect of, of my job and so did not really touch on those, but we have some great videos as well on YouTube of some of those things. So if uh, you, can, you can track those down as well. Um, Chris may even find some links to those, to some specific YouTube talks about Juniper Level and, and J.C. Ralston Arboretum's uh, rock gardens. So I kind of, just for the sake of ease, kind of grouped these into, into areas and tried to pick some that were quite different from each other and, and just the ones that I long to visit again, ones that I have visited multiple times and uh, ones that I just find especially striking. Of course, in the U.S., when you start talking about rock gardens, Denver Botanic Garden has really been one of the groups that's really led the way uh, in many, many ways for, for a long, long time. And that's no surprise. They're up there in the mountains and in the Rockies. And so rock gardening is, is kind of a way of life up there. They got lots of rocks and lots of alpine plants and can grow a lot of different things. And, and they've really uh, leaned into that. I've been biz visiting Denver Botanic Garden for, for quite a long time. I used to have a good friend who was in charge of horticulture there. And of course, some of their, their staff are, are good friends of mine now. Uh, so so we, have, we, we share plants back and forth. And I've put on all these when the pictures were taken, the month and the year, just year, because sometimes I'll, have, I'll revisit the same garden multiple times and show pictures. And the month, just so you get a sense of, you know, whether I'm showing you a picture from the winter or from the spring or from the summer, but a lot of them are from June because that's when I often can travel. We actually had somebody who does some work with Colorado Denver Botanic Garden, who, whose name I got through, Den, uh, through them, who came and did a joint lecture with the Rock Garden Society and then a workshop showing us how to create crevice gardens like this at the Arboretum. And it's, it's almost hard to, to really show off the rock gardens from Denver Botanic Garden because they're kind of all over the place, even though they have some areas that they, they designate more as their, their rock gardens. And they're beautiful and keep getting better. You see all these, these three pictures all taken in June, all uh, more or less the same kind of spot. And you can see they just keep getting better and better and better. At what they do and it's been four years since I've been there and I'm looking forward to when I get back there because because I always find something new about rock gardening 
And what I love, especially about Denver Botanic Garden is they really, they're committed to teaching people about types of rock gardening and the plants and, and really talking about them and educating people. And you can see where I mean, like the entire garden is kind of a, a rock garden. These are all from 20, June 2016. Love the garden. Perhaps one of my favorites in the U.S. is the University of California Berkeley Botanic Garden. Berkeley Botanic Garden, I still remember the first time I visited, I came in, I'm just wowed by their rock gardens and their, their, their palms and cycads and South American plants and South African plants. And, and then I come up and there's the North American section, the Eastern North American section, and they're growing our native plants better than we can grow them. But you know, you come there in a time like March and you can still, they've still got some a tender aloe here wrapped up a little bit. I think there had been a cold spell not too long before, but these other ice plant relatives and gazanias and things are all in bloom. I mean, it is kind of, it's almost garish at some times of the year there, but it is gorgeous. Just the variety of plants that they can grow from alpine plants because of their low humidity to uh, really subtropical aloes and things that are you know, they won't tolerate our, our cold here and then other plants that won't tolerate our summer heat and, and they really can kind of grow quite a bit of everything there. And I love that rock garden. I found I don't have a, a lot of pictures of the rock garden. I get so focused on the individual plants. I could show you slides and slides and slides of the individual plants from different times that I've visited, but it's only in recent years that I've managed to step back, I think, and take some of the broader view pictures. Because for most of my life, I've been so focused on the individual plants rather than the composition of them all. But just uh, and look at this, the aloe in the middle all flowering. If you come at different times of the year here, Rather than all of these hot pinks and yellows, there'll be a lot of the pastel South African bulbs, the Brunswickias and the, all kinds of different, different things there. The, all these amaryllis relatives from South Africa. It's, it's really, it's, it's such a striking garden. And when I visited first back in 2003, uh, I got a travel grant from the Rock Garden Society to go out to their Western Winter Study Weekend. This is out in Vancouver. That this is a, there's, there's a really interesting history behind this house. I'd recommend looking it up. But I loved this, this garden because this garden is made of rock. It is, most of this is rock that was here. They added rock to it to make garden, but you know, this is where the underlying, there is no soil in quite a few areas of the garden. It is just that bedrock. And they really took it. And you can see this is March, 2003. This is August, uh, 2013, basically the same spot. You can see that the house uh, right there is a little more hidden in the back corner, but you can see that it's really filled in. And, and it's, it's a fun garden because there's a house up here and there's some lawn area, but you really explore through this. There are pathways winding through and the pathways are so well hidden through their rock garden that you don't even realize that they're there until you're walking on them or you see somebody else's head bobbing along kind of behind these plants and around here. Um, it's not a large garden, but it is, it is a, a beautiful place. And one that I was glad I got a chance to go back to. And you can see different characters this time of year, early in the season, there are some of these little tiny bulbs popping up. There's some heaths and things like that, but it's, it's very early in the season. And as you get later, you see it becomes more at late summer, like many of our gardens, it becomes more about foliage and texture through here against the rock, uh, which, which I really am fond of. So many great gardens out in this area of the world. 
yeah, it's hard to pick which ones are, which rock gardens are your favorite. Um, I think part of the reason I love this, the Abkhazi garden so much is because when I was there the first time, one of the great bulb experts, Janice Rus Ruxens was there and he was pointing out and, and teaching me about many of these little bulbs that I wouldn't otherwise have, have known a whole lot about at that time. After something completely different, or perhaps not completely. I, the Abkhazi gardens, I really like because I like how they work with the stone that exists there. This is the University of, of Mexico, uh, their botanic garden in, in Mexico City. And you know, if you know anything about Mexico City, you know it is basically built in the caldera and the stone around there is volcanic. In fact, there's some areas right beside this botanic garden where it's just the the natural kind of that rippled solidified lava that is is just existing in place. But for their rock gardens, and of course this is much of it, most of it, this is a desert garden, but in their actual rock gardens, they use that volcanic stone. And I, I love that they're using the stone that's there. It's they build the walls out of it. There's natural pieces of it where you can really see the, the striations and then they plant in there all through there and I can only imagine what this is like when the the cacti, cacti are all in flower with those really showy flowers it must be really something against that black stone it's a little rougher it's definitely going to keep you on the path because that lava stones kind of between the plants that bite and the stone that bites they don't have a lot of stay on the path signs around there but it's, it's an amazing garden. And I was really blown away when I went to Mexico, how advanced, how, uh, what their botanists and horticulturists and taxonomists were doing down there. They're doing great work. I went to give a talk at the, for the horticulture department down there. A few of us did, and it, it was really just amazed at what they're doing. Unfortunately, it is very, very difficult to get plants across the, the Mexico border legally. So I, I, there's a lot of folks down there that I would love to exchange material with, and I can send seed and things, but they have a very hard time, even with seed, sending that back from Mexico legally. There are just so many regulations, a lot of it tied back to the drug trade, which makes it difficult to move plant material back and forth. But the American Public Gardens Association and the Association of Mexican Botanic Gardens are trying to work together to, to figure out a way to make that happen because the diversity in Mexico is really just astounding. Now, this is not my picture. This is, this is one from JC. Uh, this is a picture he took at Q in uh, 1988, so spring in 1988. Uh, and I just put this in here because I thought it was interesting that although they've renovated this area multiple times, they really kept the, the flavor of it really very much the same with these large square stones almost in terraces. You can see this is, this is a renovation in almost a decade later where they've pulled everything out and are redoing it. They reset stone. They did a lot of work. And then, you know, 2011, I think they've got it a little more natural looking than they did here. Here it looked just a little more, a little more structured than this, where not everything is, is perfectly level, but you still have, you know, obviously this is very man-made, but this um, looks quite a bit more more natural uh, and and it's gorgeous you know Hugh knows how to do do their gardens well and I like that a lot of the in fact most of the British rock gardens that I really like have water features in them not all of them but many of them do they'll have a waterfall they'll have something whereas a lot of the other places where I've gone they really don't have, bring water in there like like they do in in England and some of the other European countries, but it is gorgeous. And because of the scale, they can grow plants that, are, that wouldn't necessarily fit into more typical rock garden. 
many rock gardens kind of put it at, you know, like you don't want things that are over a foot tall or so in there because, you know, then they, they start getting too big for the space. But when you have a big rock garden, you can put in trees and, and plants that are going to grow up tall and that you can view from farther away. And of course, they have this is their alpine house, and they have a lot of the real special little treasures in there. And they move them in and out from the other greenhouses and put in inside there um, to show off these things when they're in flower. But I was really concentrating on the the true rock gardens. Staying around in in the UK, going up to to Scotland though, Edinburgh. Their rock garden I love, but I found it very hard to photograph. I actually wanted to see this rock garden so bad that I was on a trip to England. I flew into Edinburgh, rented a car, went to visit the their rock garden and, and then ran through the rest of the garden and then drove a fair ways to Yorkshire that evening because I really wanted to, I wanted to see this because it's so well known and have not been back, but I do plan on it. You know, and again, because of where this is situated in their garden, they use the backdrop of the rest of the garden that really, you know, you go through these very, these very open places, but you can see the shade ahead and you see the, you know, these white, white bark on these birches. So some of these places have great borrowed landscaping. This is their own uh, landscape that they're borrowing in the rock garden, but really um pretty lovely and uh this is what this is a garden you know there's always in these gardens there's always one or two things that really stick out and you can't see them very well in here but these are diorama called angels fishing rods and those are plants that i really love and hadn't really grown many of them before uh going up to edinburgh and now i i grow quite a few of those and have those around the garden. And, and if you love some of these plants, that's another great reason to become a member of the Rock Garden Society. And they do a great uh, seed exchange. And that's where, where I've been able to, to track down some of these. Now, just be aware that sometimes seed exchanges, seed gets a little mixed up or somebody who collects the seed doesn't know exactly what they have or it's hybridized or something, but that's kind of part of the fun. Sometimes you get something that you weren't expecting that's even better, but um, this, this lovely garden. And they do such a good job there of, of much like Q, but Q with those massive stone blocks just seems so big. Here, it's a little more, it's a big rock garden, but it's a little more normal scale, um, but they are still able to, to put in some larger plants and have them feel very much in place. And then Wisley. Uh, Wisley's got this lovely rock garden that comes down a hill and there's a stream that runs down through it to a pond. This is looking up at it. This was kind of looking one direction, but from the same spot, kind of looking in the other direction. And there's a path that just winds back and forth and meets up with other paths and you can take different routes through there. And it's just, it's a, it's a beautiful garden to walk through and you can see how it's it's done a little bit like a queue except for with these large blocks in some of the areas not as big as Q and where Q would have the blocks and have soil kind of inside there the a lot of this is more there's much less soil in there and so the plants are kind of growing out of these crevices and creeping down um, but you see the ferns love it and the, the mosses and they have everything from plants that really want it hot and baking to more moisture loving and, and shade loving because it's there are all these different aspects to it. There's more up at the top um, before you go down that area, but gorgeous. Now, the first time I visited, I had just read about their brand new crevice garden. And this is where I really, the first time I'd really read about true crevice gardens where the the stones are, I mean, they are tight to each other. They really are in there. And I thought this was a lovely thing. It's kind of a square area with cut in so you can go kind of inside the, the crevice garden. And it builds from lower up to, to higher. 
so when you're down here, you see all that, but the pathway actually is sloped around it. So it's kind of this more or less the same height. And this was not terribly long after it, it had been installed. And you can see it's, it's looking lovely. I went back several years later. This was on one of the tours that we, we led over there. And you can see how it's filled in between this and this. And was, May was just absolutely full of flower and color. Little Daphnes and, and uh, the sea pinks or marias and, and primroses and bellflowers and penstemons and phloxes and just a little bit of everything going in there. Beautiful thing. Cambridge, this rock garden I put in because it's, it's a bit different than some of the other ones. This is very flat in a lot of the area of it. And another one that was high on my list to visit was Beth Chatto's garden. And I could do two or three hours talking about Beth Chatto's garden. She's amazing. But, but what I really was excited to see there was her, her gravel garden, the, the dry garden. She'd written such a wonderful book about it that I know inspired a lot of people um, that I really wanted to get out and see this where it's it basically seems like the same material, the paths and then what's going on inside the beds are basically the same material. It's just, there's some, some soil mixed in with a little bit with this and this gravel's mounted up higher and you plant in that and the, the, the roots really go down and seek out the moisture. And this is something that I have really thought that we should try in the Southeast and maybe we'll, we'll, we'll look at this at the, the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. I think, you know, one of our problems with so many of the, the little alpine type plants is our high humidity and our moisture. So if we're growing them in, in gravel like this, then maybe we'll have, we would have better success with, with some of those plants, much like we do in the crevice garden. But just between the crown of the plant and the, the roots, you just have so much more room for air to move around and to keep the plants from rotting. And it really is, you know, some of the areas were they're designated more as beds, but others it's just kind of mounds, mounds up onto there. And boy, the plants do well. Of course, it seems like everything does well in England. So, you know, that's why we have to try it down in the Southeast. I think, I think there, there could be something to a true gravel garden for us um, in terms of success. And, you know, it's always great to be able to see and talk to some of these people who've inspired you for so long. You know, I had written, read all of Beth Chatto's books, you know, the damp garden, the dry garden, all of those kinds of things. So getting to meet her, um, most many of you, our members probably recognize Tim Alderton, um, who's one of our horticulturists, and Bobby Wilder, who I believe is on this call right now, our program right now. They got out there. I wanted, I wanted Beth to talk about the garden and her plants, and she did for a little bit. And then Bobby got her talking about some soup that they had had when they had been together some, some years prior to that. And that was, it seemed like that was all they could talk about. I, I, I feel like we wound up getting the recipe from her at some point for, for a soup that they had had while there or something. I don't know. But it was, it was great to, to meet an icon like that. And that's, that's always one of the, the joys of, of getting out and in, into these gardens is, is you see the personality in the garden. And then when you meet the person, you're like, oh yeah, I, I definitely see that, that personality. There's a reason why she was writing those books. It's because she was doing stuff that nobody else was doing because, you know, she was one of those people who, if you were going to zig, she was going to zag. So if you're doing something that completely different from everybody and having so much success, you ought to, you ought to figure out how to, how to let them know. And that's exactly what she did. It was very sweet of her to come out and visit with us back there in 2011. Now going over to mainland Europe. And for all my travel, I have 
traveled relatively little in Europe. So I don't have a ton of photos from different European gardens. And I know that there are some amazing rock gardens in the Czech Republic and in Austria and, and Germany and places, but, but I haven't really visited them. But if you want one of the, the more unusual rock gardens, you go to Monaco in the exotic garden in Monaco, which is built into a cliffside. And you walk down along paths on this cliffside. This is another from another trip we the Arboretum took with other folks down there. But it's just what a what a odd but fun garden to see. If you've never been there, put it on your bucket list. My wife, who does not is not a plant person, this is the place that she still talks about. Every time she sees, you know, some kind of little funky succulent, she'll say, you know what that reminds me of? And I say, yes, I know. And you can kind of see in here the steps that are built into here. This is, it's just entirely created on this, this cliff face that you can walk down. But the problem with that is, <laughs> this is the gardener. <laughs> <laughs> they're strapped up and I don't know, they're like blasting into the side of the, the cliff so that they can plant something into this. No thank you to that. Not only would you go crashing down, I don't know how many hundred feet before you hit the ground if you fell, but everything you hit has spines and spikes and thorns and prickles on there. So yeah, I don't think so, but it is neat to visit it. And then down to New Zealand. New Zealand, I was not expecting, when I went there, was not really thinking about them in terms of their rock gardens. But they, they have some of my very favorite rock gardens in the world. The Christchurch Botanic Garden has some, has some nice ones. And there are some great nurseries that do it, like this Hokanui Alpines that I visited. You know, I mean just plants growing to perfection there. Helps when you're going to sell them to have them growing and looking good. I, those guys don't ship very well and trying to get them from New Zealand home where they probably wouldn't grow anyway was not a good idea, but boy, I was tempted to buy some plants from there. But Auckland Botanic Garden, kind of like Berkeley, they can grow anything there. You know, this is an aloe back here in the back, this big, huge plant, but they're also growing euphorbias that we would grow and all kinds of other things in these uh, larger scale rock gardens. And I mean, strelitzias and nephophias and everything, just, just beautiful, beautiful place. Oh, I want to go back. But my favorite rock garden out of any botanic garden that I've ever visited, bar none, is Dunedin Botanic Garden, Dunedin, uh, New Zealand. Also, I think my favorite town, uh, city in New Zealand is Dunedin. But their rock garden, again, it's on a slope with switchbacks back and forth, large enough to have some of these larger things in here and, and bigger shrubs, but it's a true rock garden. It's got little tiny things tucked in all over here and there. I probably have a thousand pictures just from this rock garden of individual plants that I'd never heard of before. And this is kind of a, from the bottom, you can kind of see the scale of it. And it's, you know, it goes way off in both directions, but look at that, that Anchusa right there, just, or Lithodora, I think going over and seeing those, those blues and those oranges, just all the colors are so vibrant there. And this is early spring for it. And, you know, it just changes and becomes a, a different beast through every season. But I, it is, as, as far as rock gardens go, I do not think they can get any better than this one. It feels natural but also feels like you're in a garden. It's got the right, for me, for me, all these things are personal. It's got the right balance of free flowing and letting plants do their thing with maintaining them and keeping them in bounds and not, and looking 
somewhere between maintained and natural. But always what's, what's some of the most fun is visiting gardens of that belong to people and, and being in the gardens with them. Beth Chatto's garden, you know, that started out as her personal garden and, but it's, you know, it's a botanic garden now. It's got a huge nursery and it's got a restaurant and whatever, but out at Yamaguchi Rare Plant Nursery in, in Japan, Mr. Yamaguchi has created this, this rock garden and he's up on a mountain and this, this kind of goes from his garden into the, the native plants that are around there, but he's created this lovely rock garden through there. So walking through there with him is exciting. Communication's difficult, but he'll, you know, he can point to a plant and he'll tell you where he collected it in Japan or China you know, often pointing out things about plants. He collected, you know, this plant because it stays smaller than all the other ones. And, you know, in the same amount of time, this rhododendron would have been, should have been twice as big, but he could tell it was going to be little. You know, that's, he's, and, you know, I'm not sure how old he is, but he's still as excited about every little plant than that he was, I'm sure, 40 years ago. 50 years ago. And, you know, if you get excited about a plant, he'll rush off and go find one in the nursery that he's growing some little rooted cutting or fresh graft and yank it out and give it to you. And the hardest part is remembering what he gave you because you'll walk away with handfuls of things. But I, I love visiting people's personal gardens because that's, that's kind of the magic. John Massey back in the UK, going back over there, you know, he doesn't, he probably wouldn't say that he's a rock gardener. He'd say he's just a gardener, but areas of his garden, certainly I would consider to be rock gardeners type of garden. And wherever he has, you know, a place where a plant can go, whether it's a wall or anything else, you know, he's going to stick Lewisias in there and other plants. And really he kind of creates the whole garden the way many other people create their rock gardens and as you get in through this area you know there are it is a rock garden just being created with in this area with mostly woody plants john massey's garden may be the single most best maintained garden that i've ever been in that's a combination of pretty darn good scale and the diversity and and everything in there he's the he was the owner of owner, he's the owner of Ashwood Nurseries, which is famous for their hellebores. Which Dick Tyler, who's going to be coming to speak, is a very good friend of John Massey. Um, now John's into hepaticas, the the liverworts. We've, we're trying to get him to come here and give a talk, but he won't leave his liverworts, his hepaticas, alone for more than a couple of days. He says, so I'm not sure, but. He is, he's pretty amazing how he creates that rock garden, both kind of that natural and then also using stone and in, in other very cool ways. He's kind of enclosed this little seating area so you can walk around the garden, but he's got this just done with these stones set upright in the ground. These greenhouses are where he does all his hepaticas, a gajillion of them. And of course, you know, what I really, really love is getting out into the, into mountains and seeing the plants in the wild. These are just a couple shots from Mount Evans outside of Denver in June. And this is yeah, one of the most diverse rock gardens that I've ever seen. There's so many things that were growing in there and mixing together just just naturally among the rocks uh, really beautiful space so i'm going to stop there and i will answer questions if there are any so i see there's some questions so people are asking about have getting some information from about nargs and like chris was answering a question about memberships uh, i mean about our trips and uh, we try to do a big trip every year. Of course, we, we managed, we were in Ecuador in February of 2020. So we managed our 2020 trip. 
we have decided against a 2021 trip just because even if we feel pretty comfortable about say a late summer or a fall trip there's just you know people aren't going to be wanting to put money down now for a trip so we're putting off 2021 haven't made a decision on where we'll go in 2022 but since it'll have been a while we'll probably do a, a pretty big trip other places we've gone we've been to cuba south africa ecuador we did kind of the Mediterranean, we did the lake region of Italy, Monaco, and Mediterranean region of France. We did the UK for the Chelsea Flower Show. Feel, uh, oh, in New Zealand, we did New Zealand as well. So, and they fill up fast. If you, when we advertise those, they tend to fill up pretty fast. We only take about uh, 30 or so people. So Chris is off because his camera and audio are not working. Question, do these gardens amend the soil before planting? There's, it depends on the garden, but yes, usually it's a, it's a mix of soil, stone, sand, coarse sand. What we use here is we use a product called Permatil. We mix about one third to one half permatil in with just a good garden soil. For our rock gardens, you don't want it to, to have too much fertility and you want it to have perfect drainage. That's that's the real key. I got my camera working again, Mark. There was a question fairly early on that I thought was kind of interesting and I didn't know the answer. Catherine asked, is there a ratio of area between the rocks and the plant material? No, uh, it really depends on what you're trying to grow. You know, smaller rocks and smaller spaces, you know, are great with smaller plants. But, you know, if you're using boulders, larger stone, you can use larger plants. It's just you want everything to be in scale. And really, that's I am. I love rock gardens. I am not a like personally haven't done rock gardens. I've worked with them in botanic gardens. I'm sure there are people who could speak more eloquently than I, probably with the Rock Garden Society, about that. But yeah, I think it's really all about keeping everything in scale. If you're using smaller rocks and put, trying to put in larger plants, they just they seem like rock chips. But if you use boulders and just have little tiny things, sometimes little tiny things can get lost. So it, it's really, that's, I think, would be the the key it's a question about how do you keep woody small like in john massey's garden he prunes all the time he is he's really he everything is controlled in his garden but you can select plants that are smaller and when they start getting too big take them out either get rid of them or plant them somewhere else in a, in a more typical garden area and and replace them have you seen rock gardens recycled with concrete slabs that's, yeah, I mean, Tony Avent uh, out at Juniper Level Botanic Garden has a, an incredible uh, crevice garden created out of concrete slabs. It's gorgeous. It, it's very functional. I know there is a YouTube video about that whole garden on our website, on our I, YouTube channel. I gave the YouTube links or earlier. So, that, yeah, there's a link in the, the chat. Question, what's the difference between scree garden and rock garden? A scree garden is a specialized type of rock garden. A scree garden is is closer to what Beth Chatto was doing with her gravel garden. Scree is technically kind of that loose gravel that accumulates kind of at the base of cliffs and things like that. It tends to shift and move. So it's less about the space in between larger rocks and more about the growing in this very, very loose soil. Our, where is the crevice garden? Our crevice garden's on our rooftop. The crevice garden at Juniper Level Botanic Garden is over near their growing greenhouses. You can't miss it if you go there. Mark, I think Jill might be asking about the crevice garden that you talked about earlier, the one that was brand new that just had the, the stones. Oh, yeah, that was, at, that was at RHS Wisley. So the Wisley Garden in England. Was that Walking England? Right out it, nearby London. It's a cab ride off of Lund from London. 
so where would you get rocks in this area? There's, you know, there's a question about what kind of rock to be used in this area, since especially as you get farther to the southeast, we don't have rocks. Whatever you like, we've got some great rock yards. You know, uh, if 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 I were creating a crevice garden at my house, in part because the stone that I've already put out, like for walkways, is Tennessee sandstone. I would use slabs of, of Tennessee sandstone with the, with the kind of the more orangish tint to it, but you can use whatever you want. I actually had somebody who does great, great rock gardens, you know, well, does great stone work out at my house and, and was talking about some, fixing some things I didn't like from previous work and doing some other things. And he basically said he'd have to rip out everything I had because he's got to feel the stone and he doesn't feel the stone that I already had. So we decided I, I can't afford to rip out everything I've been doing. Um, <laughs> so uh, let's see if there are other things. Well, there, there was a good question. I thought Carol uh, or uh, Carol or Alexander asked, is there a definition of a rock garden? put you on the spot we got we got bobby ward on here bobby wilder somebody who can who can answer that I, you know a definition of a rock garden i have seen people who say you know i have a rock garden and they've got a garden that they've mulched with you know big gravel or you know brick chips the red things or whatever typically I also Okay, uh, I also linked Bobby's lecture that he did for e either us or NARG several years ago in the uh, chat. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I mean, typically, typically when a rock gardener is saying a rock garden, they are talking about a garden that kind of mimics a mountain where you've got really good drainage, you've got little pockets for planting and crevices and plants kind of creeping over and down it gets stretched into kind of xeric gardening a little bit, the dry gardening. So there's a lot of different ways to take rock gardening, but you know, at its simplest, it's using stone and plants to, to create a garden, but not kind of in the Japanese meditation style so much, but more as a natural, I don't know. What'd you, how'd I do with that, Chris? I thought sounded pretty good. And uh, Penelope had a good question slash suggestion. She said, could John Massey do a Zoom meeting about his garden? Ooh, now there's a thought. Maybe we could get him to do that. That's a I great was thinking idea. A lot of uh, he, is, he is such a nice guy. And I had never met him before. I got in touch with him, asked if I could come and visit. And he said, of course. He knew the, you know, he knows the Arboretum well. We have a lot of mutual friends in common, like Dick Tyler. And, you know, he's British, so I, you know, and he's known for like cyclamen and hellebores and, and hepaticas, which can be kind of fussy little plants in some ways. And I was expecting, I, I don't know what I was expecting. And when I got there, there's this guy and, you know, he's got buzz cut white hair and kind of dirty clothes. And you can tell he's been gardening, but he's on the phone with somebody from Japan he gets off the phone, he takes us Americans around, shows us through the garden, gives us a nice meal. And then somebody from New Zealand shows up as we're leaving. They want to see the garden and talk to him and whatever. And so he was just this, this incredible mix of a real dirt under the fingernails gardener. You could tell that's what he does every day as he spends it out in the garden when people like us will leave him alone long enough to get out in the garden and and actually do it. Really a wonderful person. Maria asked, can you recommend some miniature evergreens for rock gardens? Yeah, I you know, if you've got a good rock garden with great drainage, there's some some really neat little dwarf Daphne that are very cool. You know, depending on how dwarf you mean, you know, in terms of herbaceous evergreen perennials, things like dianthus are great. The creeping phlox are great. Those do wonderfully. There's some, some of the really small agaves that do great in a situation like that, that are evergreen. And then in terms of conifers, 
you know, there are there are some great dwarf Hinoki cypresses and little dwarf pines, the really tiny mugo pines and others. You know, there's 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 a lot out there. I'd say, you know, if you you do some some exploring online, you can find a lot of things. The one thing to remember with a lot of the conifers is you want something that really can tolerate if you have a, a sunny rock garden, something that can take intense sun. And so a lot of those mountain plants can, those high elevation things from the, you know, the Rockies, they take a lot of intense sun and heat during the summer, and then they can take the cold. Whereas some other things like the Camacypris, the Sawara and, and Hinoki cypresses, they don't like that super intense heat, even as, you know, the dwarf plants. So you can run into problems with them. So I stick to a little bit more of the pines and dwarf firs and things than and dwarf spruces, excuse me, than in rock gardens, than the camacypress or the other plant I was going to say just zipped out of my head. But if you've got a little shade, then, then you can in those other gardens. I believe that takes care of the questions in the chat, Mark. All right. Yeah, somebody said something about conifer kingdom. They, they're they great for dwarf conifers. Stanley and Sons do some great dwarf conifers. There are a lot of places to get them. We, we sometimes sell them. But yeah. All right. I am happy to answer any more questions people have. Everybody have a... Great holiday. I think we'll be we'll be out for two weeks. Is that correct, Chris? That's correct. Yep. So two weeks we will not be here. So if you really just Jones and for something, go to YouTube and you can watch watch an old one or something from before. Mark? Yes. Where's John Massey's garden? In England. It's I can't remember exactly. Ashwood Nurseries. You can look up Ashwood Nurseries. The nursery is there. It's, it's a phenomenal retail nursery, great restaurant, really one of the best run nurseries I've ever seen anywhere. And then John lives right beside that. I don't know if they let him come over to the nursery anymore. I think he is mostly retired from the nursery side. Probably sneaks over and grabs plants, but yeah, you'd have to, you can look up Ashwood Nurseries in the UK and find out. Gorgeous garden though. Mm -hmm. All right. So 36 weeks. That's that's not too bad. Great achievement. I tell you what. I think I finished this one just in time because I am. Oh, our, our lane just my voice. The plant buggy will be taking a break for the holidays as well. Its last day is next Tuesday. Last day is next Tuesday. Is that right? Yep. All right. Look, I'm going to be there on Tuesday. Maybe I'll see what's in there. Chris right. did learn a lesson this time with a plant cart. When you buy something off the plant cart, plant it when you get home or else you've got a whole front array of the Arboretum. <laughs> I got a little bit behind. Uh, that's how I always am. <laughs> it happens. It it's happens. called my driveway. Get on the ground quick. All right. All right. Mark, you Th thank you, Mark. Thank holiday. you, Chris. Thank you, Linda. everyone. Thanks, Dick. Thanks, Linda. Yeah. And our Linda, I missed that. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Y'all have, have a wonderful holiday. You too. You too. And anybody that needs rocks, come to Davie County and dig a hole. That's all <laughs> we have is rocks. Yeah. There's always a rock where you don't want one, for sure. Mm -hmm. I could have shown pictures of the the Fairchild, uh, not Fairchild, but, well, Fairchild's home down in Coral Gables, which I'm drawing a blank on the name of it right now. The, the, the Kampong, it's nothing but coral. The whole, the grounds are all coral. And so whenever he wanted to plant something, 
he had to dynamite, uh, he would set off dynamite charges and blow a hole in the coral and fill it with soil and plant there. And still today, if they wanna plant something where there isn't another plant, they have to get in some heavy equipment to break up the coral. I don't, I don't think they dynamite anymore, but that whole <laughs> garden is basically built on rock. We're not quite that bad, but close. No, no. <laughs> That's the kind of rock garden you don't want to have. Drainage is real good, though. <laughs> yeah. All right, everybody. It was great. It's been a great 2020, at least in on Wednesdays at 3 o'clock for me. So yeah. thank you all for, for joining me and letting me talk about plants because uh, I'm not surrounded by enough plant people every day like I usually am with all our volunteers and and staff. So this has been this has been life saving for me. So we'll keep thank you next for year. committing to them. Yeah, thank you and Chris both. All right, you take care, Linda. Thank you. Thank you. All right, bye, everybody. Enjoyed it. See you all later. Bye bye. <laughs>